We have been looking at Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 4, where the Hebrews writer mentions and discusses the great salvation. Therefore, we ought to give them more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> We've noted several aspects of that great salvation, but we began noticing last Sunday why it is a great salvation. He refers to it as a great salvation. Why is it? <clears throat> There were other salvations that we read about in the Scriptures, and we discussed this last week, that all of those salvations were great. But this is the greatest of all salvations. It was truly first spoken by the Lord. And in previous lessons, we looked at that aspect, the first he is the one who gave birth to that great salvation. He is the one who brought it forth, who it originated with him. But this is a great salvation because it is spiritual and not physical. And all of the other salvations that we see through the Old Testament and the illustrations, examples that are given there, for our learning and admonition, they were physical in nature. They were not spiritual in nature. When uh, Noah was saved from the flood, it was a physical salvation. When Lot was saved from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, it was a physical dis uh, salvation, not spiritual. This is something, though, that involves the spirit of man or the soul of man and not simply the physical body. And Jesus expresses that importance when he asks the question, What shall a man be profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16 and verse 26. And so in... He tells them to beware of covetousness in Luke 12 and verse 15 and gives an illustrate or a parable in relationship to that covetousness and shows that here is someone who he's abounded plentiful, has all of these things. He tears down his barns, builds greater more barns, says, my soul is at ease. I have everything that I need now. And God says, Thou fool, this night shall be thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? And he makes the application then in verse 21 of Luke 12, that so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This Great salvation is a spiritual salvation. It affects the soul of man. But a second reason that it is a great salvation is because it is universal. In 1 Timothy 2 and verses 3 and 4, we see in this God's desire. When Paul writes, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. There's God's desire, God's wish, if you will. God has the desire for all men to be saved. 
when you get into the subject of Calvinism, and we talk about the tulip in particular when we're talking about Cal uh, Calvinism, but it goes back to, and the reason for that tulip and those five points is because of an incorrect view of God and man, and God, particularly God's sovereignty. And that if God wills something, if it is, then it is his sovereign desire, and that sovereignty cannot be changed, it cannot be altered. It's going to take place. If that were true, then all men, since it is God's desire that all men be saved, all men would be saved. We would have universal salvation. Doesn't matter how you live, what you do here upon this earth. You can be the vilest of human uh, beings, or you can be the best. It's not going to make any difference. You're all going to go to heaven. That's universalism. But yet, if God's sovereignty is overriding everything, then all men will be saved because that's God's desire. But of course, we realize not everyone will be saved. We see this, the principle again in Titus 2 and verse 11. When it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. So here we have God's desire. Now then we have God's grace. And I think it's important here to notice it is the, that specific type of grace of God that brings salvation from a physical sense. Every person upon the face of this earth enjoys God's grace. He makes the sun to shine upon the good and the evil. He sends rain upon the just and the unjust. That is that all men enjoy God's physical grace. Very simply as a recipient of living here upon this earth. But here is a, another type of grace. It is a grace that brings salvation. Now then... Again, we're dealing with the spiritual now, not the physical. And that grace has been extended to all men, not just some. We continue on in Hebrews 2 and verse 9. And there the Hebrews writer says, But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And so we have God's desire. It is that all men be saved. We have God extending his grace that brings salvation to all men. And we have the fact that Christ died for every man. There's the universal nature of this salvation. I'm mentioning Calvinism. One of the points of Calvinism is the L in that tulip is a limited atonement. They believe that since God's sovereignty is going to save some and others are going to be lost, that God determined was going to be lost. They're going to go to hell no matter what. It would be worthless for Christ to die for those people who God had already determined to send to hell. Why did it have Christ die for them, shed his blood for them? And so they began teaching a limited atonement. Christ didn't really die for every man. He only died for those whom God elected to save. And yet we see these passages where God's desire is for not just the limited number to be saved, but for all men to be saved. We see God's grace not just extended to a limited few that he had already determined to be saved, but for all men. 
Christ goes to the cross and he dies upon the cross, not just for the limited few that God had determined to save, but for every man. And just as an aside here, some of our brethren who have difficulty with this same all men principle. Do good unto all men, especially them of the household of faith, Galatians 6 and verse 10. But they say, no, that doesn't mean all men. That only means Christians. They have the same problem as the Calvinist in limited atonement. It's not a limited aspect. It is for everyone. It is universal in nature. One of the great contrasts between the Old Testament and the New Testament. When God made these promises to Abraham, including in those promises a land promise. I'll give you, your descendants, this land. And also that in relationship to his descendants, that those who were his descendants would be blessed. They, he would make them a great nation. They would be his special people. He would be their God. And so there was a special relationship that God had with Israel that he did not have with all of the other nations and all of the other people. It was, though, limited in that scope to Israel. Now, I realize that others could become proselytes to that Jewish religion and accept that Jewish religion. But God had a special relationship with them. It was a limited aspect. Now, the purpose of that, of course, was to preserve a people through whom Christ would come. I need to add that aspect within it, because if we don't understand that, we can't understand a lot that the Bible is teaching. God selected that nation Why? because of Abraham and because in Genesis 12 and verse 3, he says all of the families of the earth are going to be blessed through thy seed. And so there had to be a preservation of that seed till Christ could come. And in the preservation of that seed, there is a selection of a nation Israel, that you will be my people, unlike other nations. But now then we get to the New Testament time, and instead of it being limited to the Israelite nation, and by the way, the early, uh, during the life of Christ, they still considered it a Jewish aspect. The Messiah was going to come to bless them and to deliver them, they didn't have a universal aspect of it. They didn't have that type of thinking. But under the New Testament time, it does become universal. That gospel began, Acts 1 and verse 8, in Jerusalem, extended to Jerusalem, or Judea and Samaria as instructed by God, and then as instructed by God to the entirety of the world. began with Jerusalem, but it went to the entire world. It was universal in nature. And that all men had that opportunity to become, say, by the way, in Acts 10th chapter, and the 11th chapter, the denominational world calls upon Acts 10th chapter. And here's the coming of the Holy Spirit upon Cornelius and his house. They hadn't been baptized. No, they hadn't. But what was the purpose of it? The purpose was to show Peter and the Jews what God had just revealed to Peter by the vision that God gave unto him 
that thou shalt not call any man common or unclean. And so whosoever in any nation worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Why? Because the gospel is for all men. And that's the determination when the Jews met Peter when he came back in Acts 11th chapter. And Peter rehearsed all of the details. And they concluded, well, yes, the God has granted unto them that the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? They recognize the universality of the gospel. That it was for every man. Thus, it is the greatest of all salvations. Why? Because it is universal in nature. But then it's also the greatest of all salvations because of its cost. We value something based upon what we pay for it. A house, for example that we pay $100,000 for, we value that more than a house that we might pay $10,000 for. And I know those figures are probably old. You probably should use half a million dollars and $100,000. That probably would be closer to the ideas of today. But the principle is the same. We value it based upon the cost, what it cost us. And then if somebody says, you know, I can get this land and this house, it's, going, it's beautiful, it's a huge house in it, and it only cost me $50. Ah, uh, sure. Right. Well, what? We know it's not true. Why? Because the value of it is based upon the cost of it. And that would be much more valuable than you know, just a pittance in relationship to houses. What's the cost of it? The cost of this salvation was the greatest cost, the greatest price that could ever be devised. John 3 and verse 16, that golden text of the Bible, for God so loved the world. And notice the aspect of that small word there, so. It shows the extent. It isn't that God, for God loved the world, but the extent of that love. So loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here's his only begotten Son. And God's love for man, this world, was so great, it extended to such an extent that here's this precious one that he gave to die for sinful mankind. That's what Paul expresses in Romans 5 and verse 8. That God commended His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Here we were, here's our state, that of we've sinned. We've come short of the glory of God, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. Or verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. The Hebrew, or Rome, Paul goes on in Romans 5 to show that because of that sin, we were at enmity with God. We weren't at peace with Him. We didn't have unity with Him. We were at odds with Him because of sin. Your sins have separated between you and your gods. Your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and verse 2. Going all the way back to the beginning, when Adam and Eve committed sin, what happened? God cast them out of the garden. Cast them away from His presence. 
because Habakkuk 1 verse 13, Thou art of pure eyes and behold evil, canst not look upon sin. God is a holy God. And yet here is man who has committed sin. And yet, because of God's love for sinful mankind, He sent His only begotten Son to die upon the cross for us. Christ died for us. John would write in 1 John 4 and verse 9, that in this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. We have life, and that's spiritual life, because God sent His only begotten Son to this world, and He died for us. That sin produces death. That's what scriptures affirm, Romans 6 and verse 23. Uh, wages of sin is death. Or James would tell us that sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. In chapter 1 of James. Sin brings death. We are dead spiritually. But now then, we can live through Him. Through Christ. Because that great love that was extended toward us in the greatest cost that this world will ever know the greatest cost that man can even imagine. Paul would write and tell us that greater love hath no man than a man lay down his life for his friends. And yet Christ died for his, those who were at enmity, at odds, enemies of God and of his. That those people who nailed the nails into the hands of Jesus, pierced his side, that indivi those individuals who scourged him, those individuals who stood out of Pilate's, outside of Pilate's hall and yelled, crucify him, crucify him, Christ died for them. He shed his blood for them. The great cost, yes, greatest cost that man could know. How many of us would be willing to give our child for someone who it is our enemy, many who hate us, who despise us, Would we be willing to allow our child to die for that individual? And yet, that's what God did. That's the greatest of all cost. Then, this is the greatest salvation because of its promises. In St. Peter 1, verses 3 and verse 4, Peter mentions, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Here's exceeding great and precious promises to a certain extent, these precious promises are beyond our wildest imagination that God has promised us salvation. 
And we'll look at several aspects of this, Lord willing, next week. But what great promises God has given to those who will be obedient to His will. In that golden text of the Bible that we read about God's love, He says that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Salvation. An everlasting life with God. If you're not a recipient of that those precious promises, then you've got to obey Christ. Yes, Christ shed His blood upon Calvary's tree. In Hebrews 5, verse 8 and verse 9, it says that though He were a son, yet learned He obedience by the things that He suffered. And being made perfect, or being made complete, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. You see, while God's desire is for all men to be saved, He extends His grace that brings salvation to all men, that Christ died for every man, yet only those who will in humble obedience submit themselves to what God says will be recipients of those precious promises that He has to offer. Those, that which we must do is upon hearing His Word. We must believe. Believe that God is. Believe that Jesus is His Son and that He died for us. We need to make a confession of our faith in Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We must repent. We must turn from that sinful lifestyle to turn and live for God in God's way. And yes, it includes that act of baptism, being baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. And in that act of baptism, Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, we come into a relationship with God. That relationship does not exist prior to baptism. Baptism is what puts us into that relationship. It saves us from our sins. So if you've not been baptized, we encourage you to do that in obedience to what God says. But if you've be obeyed those initial aspects of baptism, we are raised to walk in that newness of life. We have life. Yes, it's an eternal life with God that we have hope for, but it is a life in the here and now as to how we are to live. And if you've not been living that way, then repent of your sins and come back to obedience and faithfulness to God. And live in the way in which God expects you to live, as He's instructed us within the pages of the New Testament. Let us pray with you for the forgiveness of those sins. And a loving Heavenly Father stands waiting and willing to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we can help you in these matters, we encourage you to come.